somewhat intimate group, uh, perhaps because uh, this is off of our normal um, meeting schedule for the observing team, but there was a number of reasons for, for shuffling things around. And I actually um, am, am very happy to see who is on the, on the call because it's a combination of people who've been both closely associated uh, with the with the UN decade planning process and and some who are maybe more peripherally associated or, or just hoping to learn more. Um, we uh, we planned the meeting, the series of meetings um, last summer when we saw the the planning, the proposed planning process uh, shaping up. Um, because uh, as as those of us who were involved in the planning from a, a US uh, standpoint, we wanted to make sure that what was a very kind of high level, complex, UN driven, IOC driven uh, process uh, was, was, was well followed and, and understood and absorbed and, and engaged in by the people in our communities who we thought could contribute to the process. And so we uh, had our first meeting back in July. I think you've all seen the link to that in the agenda. If you haven't, I encourage you to go back and, and listen to some of the recordings because there were some valuable observations made about certainly equity in a planning process and, and what that would look like, uh, especially for the Alaskans who were participating in that call. Um, and so what we're going to do today is we're going we're gonna to just do some, some touch-ins, um, 10 minutes a piece, uh, where we hear from some different perspectives from uh, an agency perspective about how this planning process might be um, used or adopted by the agencies so that we can be aware of what the, what the value of our efforts might be um, to, uh, to touch in with um, uh, Henry as uh, somebody who helped co-lead a community meeting to gather more input and then to touch in with Molly um, in her hat that she also wears as a member of the organizing committee to, to show us where we're at in the process and how we can continue to engage and contribute. Um, you know, the show's not over yet. Uh, and so we have some opportunities to, to influence the, the planning tools that are being developed yet. Um, and so we've left a, a hearty amount of time at the end for discussion. Um, we left 75 minutes for the meeting and I hope everyone can join us, though I know we might lose some at the top of the hour. Um, so with that, we're going to we're going to start off as we try to customarily do with an update from Roberto Delgado, who is serving as the chair of our federal U.S. Arctic Observing Network um, board. And so he's going to do some report outs from that board uh, and field your questions. Uh, Roberto, thanks. All right, thank you, Sandy, and good afternoon and good morning to everyone. I uh, appreciate you all uh, giving up your time uh, today to, to, to listen to our updates and to lay in on, on different discussion points. Um, so as Sandy said, I am uh, the current chair of the, uh, of the US Aon board, uh, which is a federal only body, but is really part of a larger entity, uh, which ultimately serves as a national coordination body for, for SEON of sustaining Arctic networks which is uh, internationally, uh, an international initiative uh, sort of co-sponsored by, by um, Arctic Council AMAP and, and the International Arctic Science Committee. Um, what I wanna take time today is just cover a few of the main themes that we've been working on over the months, started prior to the holidays, um, wish everyone happy new year. Um, and one of the reasons that why I am now sort of part of this meeting on a regular basis is because we are rolling out a communication strategy for US Aon. Um, and this is, has sort of two, almost threefold aims. Um, one is really about um, you know, sort of broadening the exposure of US Aon, uh, including in, in, in meetings like this uh, through the IARPA collaboration teams and sub teams, but also trying to provide greater clarity uh, on the role of US Aon, uh, who we are, what we do, and, and who are all the other components that, that, that tie into to the US Aon, um, as well as to just generally increase the profile of, of the group. Um, related to, to the latter, in terms of increasing profile, we are um, in early stages of developing some additional activities. Um, uh, we are looking into standing up a, a new page within the IARPIC collaborations um, website 
There are two sort of informational sites out there. One is hosted by the, the Alaska Ocean Observing System, or AUS, uh, on a sub page, which is not always easy to, to find. Um, and also uh, through, through NOAA's website, there's a little bit of information, just a general overview. But we'd really like to sort of consolidate all the available resources, some of the, the reference documents by which we operate, um, and also really allow for, for greater engagement uh, across broader communities, not just um, sort of the, the existing members right now. Um, also related to that, to increasing profile, um, we are uh, in discussions with IARPIC uh, to hold uh, an IARPIC-wide webinar, uh, likely later this spring. Um, we are in the process of developing uh, some of that content and format, and once that is scheduled, uh, we'll make sure to communicate and disseminate that information out to, to as, as many of you as possible. Um, hopefully all of you plus additional colleagues and, and network uh, professionals. Um, so that's one of the main things, communication strategy moving forward. Uh, we really want to highlight uh, our work over the coming year. Um, uh, another activity that I'd like to provide a brief update on is um, USA on board has been also drafting and reviewing uh, terms of reference, um, basically just codifying the way in which uh, board members and, uh, and, and the structure of, of USA on including the sub team um, and, and uh, our uh, past teams as well. And so that again is helpful to, to clarify the role, the structure, the responsibilities, and, and how we operate as a board and a larger entity, including as a national coordination office for SEON. Um, so there has been some internal review at this point through IARPIC, which is sort of, I want to say a sister, but sort of overarching um, agency or interagency that, that uh, we are linked to. Um, and so um, we've received agency comments on our, our draft terms of reference, which we are, are working on to revise and those would also uh, eventually end up on, on the, on the I, IRP Collaborations website once those are finalized. Um, lastly, uh, one of the other things that has been keeping a number of us on the board busy uh, from the US Aon standpoint is contributing to the next five-year IARPIC Arctic Research Plan. Uh, a number of us are on the drafting teams. Um, and one of the, even though, um, there, there, so there will be a, a request for, for a public comment uh, starting next month and, and lasting to early June. Um, but the main takeaway is that um, in contrast to previous drafts of plans, there's been some restructuring instead of uh, having very specific uh, research ob objectives that are, trend, that are that are disciplinary. There are more cross-cutting priority areas um, that um, that have been identified. These include things like community resilience and health, Arctic system interactions, uh, sustainable economies and livelihoods, and also risk risk mitigation and hazard management as broad cross-cutting uh, priority areas. And supporting those uh, are what are being um, defined as foundational activities. These are not so much specific research objectives, but more at processes um, and tools and resources to, to support those, those broad priority areas. Foundational activities include things like data management, technology development, um, indigenous like research and knowledge co-production, um, and then one that's a mouthful, which includes monitoring, observing, prediction, and um, Modeling, what is it? <laughs> monitoring, excuse me, monitoring, observing, modeling, and prediction. Uh, we uh, refer to it as MOMP, and, and uh, Sally is also helping uh, to, to work on that. Uh, so just to, to reemphasize that observing is, is a financial activity in the next plan, so we'll be cross-cutting uh, among the different priority areas. So obviously um, our role uh, as US Aon members and representatives um, has been key into developing that draft. And so uh, we are uh, excited. We recently completed a, a second order draft, which is out for agency review. Um, and then there'll be a public comment period again, starting uh, sometime in the middle of next month. So we look forward to, to, to your comments on that and ways to ensure that Arctic observing and associated data systems and modeling are, are gonna be a key component of, of uh, that next research plan. So um, I'll, I'll stop my remark there and I'll welcome any questions if, uh, if, if people have them. Thanks. Thanks, Roberto. I, I did drop the, our, our uh, webpage at AUS into the chat. Um, Hazel is actively updating this along with some of the IARPIC content. 
on USAN. And um, we would really love to be guided by your questions um, that remain unanswered when you look at that website. So um, when you get a chance, uh, have a look at it and, and please let us know what isn't clear. Um, and we'll certainly be keeping this group posted on the plans for the IARPIC web wide webinar when we set up a date. That is not easy to say. <laughs> Who knew? Um, IARPIC just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Um, okay, so uh, our next stop on the uh, on the agenda, um, we're going to hear from Anne uh, Zinken, who is, has uh, is just finishing up her Knauss Fellowship um, at NOAA and is transitioning into an ongoing position. She's been within uh, the Global Ocean uh, Monitoring uh, Program at uh, NOAA, one of the uh, point people for the UN decade and is gonna share her insights into how an agency, especially an agency like NOAA, might respond to the action plan that we're currently drafting. Um, so Anne, please. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I also saw Liz on the participants list. So Liz, if I'm forgetting anything or you wanna add anything at any point, uh, just let me know or jump in afterwards. I'm just gonna give a very brief uh, overview um, what NOAA is thinking and what we're thinking um, are the benefits in participating in the UN decade and some some updates um, we have. So generally when we were when we were discussing the UN decade with the US agencies and NOAA, obviously the UN decade goals um, and the decade out outcomes closely align with the ones of NOAA, which is of benefit. Um, there's a vast opportunity to initiate and participate in co-design of decade actions. Um, just with this IOC call that was due mid-February, there's been um, a lot of uh, partnerships that have formed that were already existing, but also a lot of new part uh, partnerships that were able to be formed and we're still currently um, working on, on those and um, elaborating um, that partnership program. Um, of course, there's the sharing of decade knowledge, which we're always striving to. Um, also, the decade has a strong emphasis on the decade criteria, which includes diversity, capacity development, and integration of indigenous knowledge, which is obviously a big, a uh, huge um, topic of interest, especially for, for the Arctic and the Arctic Action Plan that's being drafted right now. Um, and we have uh, various interagency collaboration working groups, which uh, Liz is all part of. Um, you know, um, NOAA has representatives that have participated in all the regional workshops, including the current Arctic Regional Workshop. Um, so we're actively contributing um, to those outcomes. We're also encouraging all the programs in NOAA to take into the consideration the outcomes, all the different regional workshops we've been working on um, a document that's like overviewing and summarizing all the suggestions from the different um, regional workshops that have come out of the decade. And we're trying to um, give that to other people so they can take that into consideration. We're also participating in all the different working groups. There's an interagency working group um, among the federal institutions so we can share ideas and collaborate um, and enhance that, um, that network. Um, and we're working closely with the Consortium of Ocean Leadership to ensure implementation of the Ocean Ops outcomes uh, as well. Um, so there's a lot of uh, those discussions going on. Um, for the NOAA process, for the first round of the Decade Action uh, Call, the International Affairs Council uh, requested uh, NOAA Decade Ideas to be submitted by last October. We received 36 ideas and then we went through a vetting process where we looked at oh, like, is this um, the level that the IOC is looking for right now? Um, is this a mature idea or more like of a, like an initial idea that still needs to be developed and is more appropriate to be submitted to a later call for action? Um, we, after the vetting process, this was all um, vetted through a, a different NOAA, NOAA uh, process. We then went ahead and um, submitted proposals, which I'll I'll show you guys in a, in just a second. Um, and there is a continued effort to develop um, and further those uh, proposals that has, that haven't been submitted yet. So out of um, the 36 ideas, we have probably about 30 still um, to work on, and um, we're hope hoping that the Arctic Action Plan and 
um, some other regional workshops will help us draft proposal ideas that, that will collabor collaboratively will be submitted to the IOC at some later stage. Um, so this is a quick overview of the NOAA contributions that have been submitted for the IOC call that just closed. Um, and these are all program levels. Um, and if anyone has any questions about these, please just email me and let me know and I can put you in touch with the POC for these. But they, they're pretty broad. Uh, we have some from coastal aquaculture to sea mapping to marine, marine protected areas. Um, the global acidification uh, network is submitting something as well. And this is these are all programs where NOAA um, is the lead agency um, and this has already been submitted. So we should hear more about um, what's happening now. Um, these are some of the programs that we're aware of, and this is just a small subset of programs where NOAA is not the lead agency, but we're either are aware of this, this proposal being developed or are um, actively engaging and a, a partner. Uh, the observing air sea interaction strategy was submitted by Megan Cronin um, by the score working group and NOAA's big um, lead um, yeah, co partner in that as well. Um, same with the, the goose proposals. Goose actually putting forward three big programs that were actively um, NOAA, a NOAA representative is working with them on developing these programs. Um, just a quick update, because I'm not sure how well everyone's connected with uh, the current ongoings of the kickoff conference that was planned for May 2020, in Berlin, oh, sorry, 21 in Berlin. Due to COVID, this is reduced to a minimal capacity. So there's also only going to be a two day uh, planned kind of high level, very small amount of people activity. And we're going to have each societal benefit area is gonna hold a laboratory throughout the year. And this is supposed to be 24 hours in length. The first three hours are hosted by the different working groups, which we also have representatives on. Um, I'm currently serving as the early career ocean professional on the uh, predicted ocean um, area. And then followed by the three hours is, um, is a hosted event by the IOC. And they're asking for proposals for event ideas of what can be hosted during those 24 hours. And that's the kind of thinking that that um, will hopefully enable the different parts of the world and participants to, to be able to engage in this. And the format is really open and we can, yeah, we have pretty much a, a lot of freedom in what we wanna do. So we're brainstorming that right now, but that's a quick update. And then they're hoping that next year in 2022, we can uh, hold an actual conference uh, in person. And then I wanted to highlight some upcoming events. Um, the National De Decade Committee of the US is having a meeting next week, February 3rd and 4th. So if you're interested in any of the um, outside government US processes, especially the ocean shots, which is um, of particular interest to all the research communities and nonprofit organizations that are not government. Um, this is a great opportunity to learn a little bit more um, about that area. And I think that's it. Liz, did you have anything to add? Uh, Anne, can y'all hear me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, no, you've done an excellent job. Um, and I was just here to support uh, Anne's efforts. She and Brittany Kroll in the GOOS office have been a tremendous bolster as are all Sea Grant fellows in the grand scheme of things, I think we'd all admit, um, to the overall effort to try to figure out the meaning behind the madness on the decade. And certainly GOOS's office connectivity to the um, Ocean Ops 19 outcomes and bearing those in mind and making sure we we do something with that effort as well with this new idea with no new resources, I have to say has been absolutely crucial. So um, very pleased to see IARPIC taking a look at the decade and figuring out how we make what you had planned going forward uh, to take advantage of this idea as well. And I, I look forward to your discussions. I'm merely here to support if anyone has any additional questions that Anne can answer.
Yeah, and just as a as a heads up, the Consortium of Ocean Leadership has the Ocean Ops 19 website that they're always updating if there's a new like development and they have regular tag ups um, with the POCs driving some of their um, yeah their activities. So we're hoping at least my working group that I was working with for the Arctic Action Plan, we suggested that we might want to collaborate with the Consortium of Ocean Leadership and get the Arctic Action Plan uh, implemented on that living website. Um, so it's publicly available to a bigger community. Any any questions for Anne or Liz? And and thank you very much for for kind of breaking down that that inside the agency process for us. It's it's complicated. Um, I have a quick question. Hey, this is Kelly Ulick from NOAA's Arctic Research Program. Um, can you explain a little bit what the societal benefit area laboratories are going to look like? I know you just went over it, but I kind of skimmed out for a second. There. <laughs> So the, the different societal benefit areas, so predicted ocean, safe ocean, healthy ocean, they all get a 24 hour slot. So it's it's divided by those. And there's already a panel um, together of different um, um, subject matter experts um, and early career scientists that have worked on putting the kickoff conference together. So we worked on like, what format do we wanna do? We had different panel discussion that we needed to plan and have, so typical conference uh, planning, and now we're putting that on hold and we're getting a 24 hour slot where we get three hours that we get to plan however we want. So we can have a workshop or some learning activity or a panel discussion, but we need we are um, responsible for the three hours and then the IOC is asking for any anyone to submit uh, proposal ideas of what, what can we do during those um, uh, laboratories, they're just, that's just what they're called. <laughs> that's not super intuitive, but that's the plan for now. So, and they're supposed to be um, throughout the year. And the predicted ocean one, and the only reason why I know that uh, is because I'm on the on the working group is in September. Okay, is that um, are all of them already scheduled out that you know of? Um, I don't think definitively, but there's um, they're trying to nail down um, a date currently. Okay. Well, I'm pretty sure that wasn't. Will it be on the UN Decade website? I hope so. You know, we would we would we would not recommend you go to that website. It makes uh, finding any information terribly scary. Um, yeah. And as a matter of, of first impression, it's not exactly most ideal. So uh, thanks to the Canadians, the Decade website should be revived by the spring. So yes, and eventually everything will be on there and easy to find. <laughs> but until then, uh, certainly we can make sure this group has the dates as soon as they're available. Brilliant. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Anne. Appreciate it. And I think a point of, of just underscoring here is Anne was really speaking um, to a lot of the things that are happening as part of the global decade. Um, we've been working on the Arctic region uh, uh, action planning process. And so there's sort of this, um, this dance back and forth between what's happening at the regional level and what's happening at the global level. And so I, I do hope that when these global level kind of roundups happen, that there's going to be some direct engagement uh, of people who participated at the regional level as well. I think so. I think it's very globally driven right now because the IOC call was for programs and they're encouraged to be a little bit broader and bigger in, in scale and thought. But we have a lot of proposal ideas that we collected within NOAA um, that are regional in scale. Great, thanks, Anne. So why don't we transition to um, the discussion that Henry's gonna lead us through. And I think that this is kind of hearkening back to our July call. One of our big concerns was that the UN stuff can come in with a lot of complexity uh, that can be hard to navigate. And the regional processes are certainly a gateway to doing that navigation. Um, but, but there's a lot of work to be done to, to, to bridge. And, and so Henry's gonna uh, speak to some things that, that uh, have been happening in the Arctic region to help make that bridge. Thanks, Andy. And thanks for the chance to, to speak this morning. Um, the Arctic planning process, of course, was supposed to be in person in Copenhagen. That would have been one thing. Uh, in practice, it was held virtually. 
but on Copenhagen time. And so for Alaska, that meant starting at either 5 a.m. or 4 a.m., um, which was not conducive to, to terrific participation. Uh, many people got up early and so on, but we also lacked uh, as much participation as we might have hoped from uh, indigenous communities in, in Alaska uh, and, and Western Canada. And with that in mind, uh, Rachel Daniel and Nikush Carlo and uh, Melinda Chase and, and some others decided that we ought to have a, uh, you know, sort of a, a region specific meeting held at a, you know, a friendlier time and, and giving people from the area a chance to, uh, to, to have a conversation and, and essentially talk among themselves about what, what the, the uh, process had been like and, and what kinds of things we wanted to see. Uh, Sandy, Molly, Brendan, and, and others on this call were very helpful in, in planning that and, and setting it up. Um, and I think it was a, I think it was held in early December, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, it was a, a very good conversation with, with really good participation from the Inuvialuit region from different parts of Alaska and including a few people with, uh, I don't know if we had anybody actually from calling in from Chukotka, but we had people who are, who are from that area or have have worked there. Um, the, the themes that came up in that discussion, I think will may sound very familiar to, to those of you on the call, um, but I think they're worth emphasizing. Discussion question I would, I would pose to the group is, you know, with these ideas in mind, uh, you know, how can the, the effort that IARPIC and the US are taking, uh, you know, how can that effort be, uh, be done in a way that would, would uh, Know, address some of the some of the topics proposed by the the people in this in this regional workshop, um, and and do it in the in the manner that they propose as well. And so let me just go through a a few themes. Um, Melinda, yes, Melinda is is on the call, and uh, I'll ask her at the end if she would like to to add anything to what I'm presenting. Um, really, Rachel should be the one presenting, but she had a conflict this morning, so I'm the I'm the understudy. Sorry about that. Um, to start with, there, was, there were questions about process. Uh, this is a United Nations effort, the UN Decade of Ocean Science, and yet uh, from the perspective of a lot of the, the indigenous people, the, the UN was not really following its own principles as, as espo uh, expressed in the UN Declaration of the Rights of, in of Indigenous Peoples um, and other documents and, and including concepts like free prior and informed consent. Um, you know, it would be nice to for indigenous peoples to have been involved and to have felt like they were involved from the very beginning rather than sort of as uh, you know just having an opportunity to participate in a, in a workshop being planned by by uh, by others um, and as has often come up indigenous peoples I, I think are you know do not want to be just lumped in with with uh, stakeholders and and anyone else with a with an interest in the topic but would like some recognition of you know their inherent and, and legal rights um, as, as stewards of the land and as, as distinct peoples. Um, so I think that's, that's an important principle to, to keep in mind. Um, in terms of substance, the, <clears throat> a, few, a few ideas came up, and this is far from exhaustive, but just to give you an idea of the, the, the kinds of things that were talked about, um, several people expressed that it's very important to look at the entire food web. Uh, you know, microbes on up, not just looking at a, a, a few key species or not in the, as we often do, thinking about indigenous knowledge, thinking about the, you know, the, the large visible species that are, that, that people hunt and fish, but thinking about the health of the entire ecosystem and, and what that looks like. Um, and in doing so, to think about the indigenous conception of, of the Arctic Ocean and, and how it works and, and what that system looks like, uh, a system that, that of course, in, includes people as a, as an integral component. Um, we also emphasize that uh, you know, it would be great to have more cross-border collaborations. For example, the, you know, the very event in which these conversations were taking place with, with people from uh, Canada, Alaska, and, and some from, from Chukotka. Uh, <clears throat> again, not surprisingly, um, a, a lot of discussion was about the, the value of indigenous knowledge and how to, how to uh, make sure that indigenous knowledge is included um, you know, on, on an equal footing with with other forms of knowledge, 
um, you know, some discussions of what this looks like. The, the phrase knowledge co-production or co-production of knowledge uh, came up and, and what successful partnerships look like. And you know, there could be some work there to, to review those and, and see what, what are some of the elements or what are some of the examples. I know that often we, we talk about uh, many of these concepts and in the abstract, at least for me, they're a little tougher than when someone can say, look, here's an example of, of what we're talking about and, and what we're looking for. And I think there are plenty of good examples to point to and, and emphasizing that um, you know, this is, these kinds of things have occurred you know, in many places in the Arctic would be a, a useful contribution. Um, another point that came up was, was that of education. Uh, to look at ocean education materials um, you know, overall and also to make sure that indigenous perspectives are included equitably and not just as you know, occasional little add-ons, a little sidebar or something, a side box to, uh, to, to throw in a, a few things, but that indigenous perspectives are you know, an, an integral part of the, of the overall effort. Um, and of course, that can include things like uh, you know, st storytelling and other indigenous forms of communication. Um, the last theme that I'll emphasize before asking Melinda what I've missed is uh, the, the ways in which people can be, can be engaged. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about sustainability and other things, but what does that actually look like for indigenous peoples? Are we really all talking about the same thing? Um, or are there, are there some substantial differences in, in concepts? I, I know this is true when we talk about things like marine stewardship or conservation. Um, so what do, what do those look like and what does sustainability look like from, from the indigenous perspective? Um, and that of course should, should include recognition of, of indigenous rights, uh, you know, both on, on land and, and at sea. Uh, the other thing that we talked a, a bit about was the, uh, you know, given this, the way that the decade is organized, it's not like there's a great big pot of money somewhere that's being distributed to, to fund everybody. A lot of this is gonna be individual initiative. I think even in the US, it's not like there's a UN decade of science pot that everybody shares. It's coming from different agencies doing this in different ways and you know, in accordance with their missions and so on. So you know, what can we do with that type of initiative? And for the, for the, especially for the indigenous peoples on this call, what are the things that, you know, that they might undertake on their own, um, you know, rather than waiting for somebody else to, to come up with a, with a plan and so on? Um, you know, what, what are the things that they would see as, as worthwhile contributions and, and what would it take to, for them to get funding to take the leadership in, in doing that themselves? Um, so those were some of the themes. And I, I, as I said at the beginning, look forward to some conversation about how that fits in with the, you know, the overall US approach to, to involvement in the UN decade. Um, and just before I end, uh, Melinda, is there anything, uh, anything you'd like to emphasize from uh, you know, things that I missed or things that uh, should have a, a little more emphasis or things I got wrong? Oh, I think you covered it fairly well. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think, you know, the, the biggest thing that I can see is, you know, we've, um, you know, I'm part of the food security working group under the um, Arctic Observing um, Summit and, uh, and the group that has, um, you know, coalesced and pulled together um, and done some pretty significant work in, in this uh, COVID time um, has, uh, you know, um, that, that could be working definitely hand in hand, right? We have all these different efforts and really um, addressing that holistic approach and that uh, system approach um, I think especially with, you know, our shifts that are happening on the national front and, um, and, and, you know, to, it, it's a little bit frustrating, you know, I have to say, like, even in coming into um, trying to orient yourself as an Indigenous person and all this work that's been done already and, you know, what um, the direction that um, uh, this next decade is heading and, you know, the conversations that are happening. So I, I think, um, you know, that the whole point about um, definitely being there on even footing, on balanced footing um, is, is really critical. Um, 
you know, we have we have additional tools other than just meaningful consultation um, and uh, and that whole uh, view that um, Henry talked about in terms of you know sustainability from our own definition, right? And uh, a great deal to share in that front. Um, but we need we need the space, um, our and 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 you know rightfully so to uh, to contribute. And so I know that Rachelle is on. Um, I guess I just needed to. Uh, to stress those those points, um, even though they were already made by Henry. But um, thank you for having this uh, meeting this morning. And um, Rochelle, I don't know if you want to add some additional information. Hey, yeah, uh, sorry, I, I will have to leave um, shortly. But um, I appreciate what Henry and Melinda both said, and. I feel like, you know, going to the larger picture, I also feel like, you know, there another point to reemphasize is, is that, you know, at the UN level, there's already guidance, you know, from UN DRIP and, and, you know, if the Arctic is the first place, you know, where the decade, you know, work is going to be happening, it's really important, you know, to, you know, to be looking, you know, towards that guidance that already exists. And it's, going to be really important, you know, here um, in the U.S. Arctic also to be, you know, mindful of that and to, you know, be thinking about how to work with um, indigenous governments that, you know, the federal government recognizes, federally recognized tribes. And so, you know, I think, you know, it, it you know, it will be really important to think about how to be you know, more collaborative. And so um, I think that's the challenge for, for a, you know, for a lot of this, um, you know, rather than, you know, working top down and trying to assert, you know, knowledge, but to, you know, work together to identify challenges to address, you know, the challenges that are going to be coming and that are happening and that have happened. And then to recognize, I think the other thing, this speaks towards a lot of you know, the work that Melinda has been doing the past four years is that tribes have been taking a lead role in addressing climate change issues, have been seeking out funding to deal with it, and have been working a lot on their own and with people like Melinda to address these challenges. And, and I think that tribes need to really be supported, you know, especially now and recognize that, hey, you know, they, you know, have this knowledge about the issues, the nature of the issues, and, you know, have been working with people like Melinda and the climate Center in Fairbanks, and so that that's I'll end on that. Hi, uh, Liz Turpak here. Just wanted to, and I, I think my I think I'm my camera's working. So with apologies for not having it running beforehand. Um, just wanted to acknowledge. Uh, indeed, we could do more, at least on the U.S. front, to ensure Indigenous communities are members, for example, of our U.S. National Committee. So it's on my list to make sure that um, our national committee does have representation. I'm going to send you all a link in the chat to the information about the national committee meeting February 3rd, 4th. I think what I wanted to say is it's not too late yet. And even if the, the secretary of it, secretary has been remiss at uh, being as inclusive, um, the United States is in a poor position to judge right now. Some of you may be aware we are not members of UNESCO currently due to policy and um, as a consequence we haven't been paying dues to the IOC who is serving as the secretariat for the decade but we've recently found out we may be in a position to detail people to the secretariat um, which would enable us to help the secretariat do its job better and that the, there's no better way that, to be influential than to be within the system helping it be better at what it does so um so I think there are things that can be done. For instance, there was a literacy plan I know the Secretariat worked on. I need to do homework to find out if there was any kind of indigenous input at all with regards to that high level plan. Um, but even within the United States, as I mentioned, I think we can certainly do more. I do know that on the National Committee website, they invite groups to serve as Ocean Dexade Nexus organizations. Uh, if there are consortia of indigenous um, folks, and I apologize because this is not my background. I want to be respectful and I'm not entirely sure what terms of reference to use. Um, please do take a look at that, that link because I think it, through that you, we can start to become more aware of groups 
that need to be involved that should have been involved from the get-go. But like I say, you haven't missed much. It's literally been a year so far of trying to get our legs in terms of order within the United States to be effective during the decade. So I welcome this conversation and thank you for allowing me to listen in. Thanks, Liz, and thanks, thanks for the link. Well, um, I think that begins to speak to the discussion question that Henry raised, and we're gonna have uh, a wealth of time um, also to pick up the discussion that's, that's started here. I know Rochelle needs to leave, and so I think it was helpful to spend a little more time on, on this point right now, and I thank you very much for joining us, Rochelle. Um, so then Molly, Molly, gets the, uh, Molly gets the turn to say, you know, given these high level pieces, given some of the things at the region that we know are imperative and are, are striving to see accomplished, where are we at in the process right now? And what are the opportunities to start moving some of these ideas forward um, right now? So thanks, Molly. All right, um, thanks, Sandy. Um, so Sayon um, designated myself and Craig Lee, who is also online today as the two Sayon representatives to the, um, the Arctic uh, Planning Task Force. Um, this was set up by the Danish um, Ministry of Marine Science, and they've been uh, kind of the secretariat for this uh, year long effort. So I'm gonna share my screen here and hopefully this will work. Um, and um, we'll see if it does. Um, and it's not right at the moment, but so we'll see what else I need to do here. So uh, Hazel, you might have to do this for me. I keep going between so many different um, uh, Zoom and Google Meets and everything that it becomes a little challenging here. So it looks like I am um, slides is virtual background. Let me see. Nope, I'm not having a, I'm having a hard time here. So I'm happy to. Okay, why don't you go ahead, Hazel, and do that? Yeah, sorry yeah. about that. No problem. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I've had. I've, we're getting ready for the last Marine Science Symposium this weekend, and so we're using Cisco WebEx. Um, uh, most of that and some other different um, platforms, and it's. My, between my cameras and my audio and sharing screen sharing, it's been crazy. And I hope all of you join for the last Marine Science Symposium. I'll put my pitch in. We have over 1500 people registered for it. It starts tomorrow morning um, and there's a lot of great sessions. Uh, Gulf of Alaska Day is Tuesday, Bering Sea Day on Wednesday and the Arctic on Thursday. Um, there's a, a special session on Wednesday afternoon actually um, that AUS is co-hosting with World Wildlife Fund uh, with Russian scientists from the Chukotka region. Um, and so it'll be, it has simultaneous translation in both Russian and English. And um, you'll hear a lot about the harmful algal bloom event that happened in Russia this past year. Um, so I just sent them to Anne and she's gonna share her screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> she got a new computer and now Zoom doesn't. Okay, happen. okay. While I reboot it, so. Thanks. Okay. Go ahead, Ann. I'm just opening them there. They'll, they'll be there in a minute. Okay. And just go to the second slide anyway. Yeah. So Actually, I was able to. Are you able to see that? Yep. Okay. I will put it into presenter mode. Yeah. Yeah, if you could just go to the second slide. So, you know, again, um, this is this initiative that came from the UN starting actually in 2017. So um, uh, the implementation plan for this has actually been adopted um, as of last summer. It's a fairly high level implementation plan for the overall uh, UN decade. Um, but there is, um, I think there are some priorities included in it. Um, next slide. And there were, have been these regional um, um, planning sessions all over the globe. I participated one um, a year and a half ago in Tokyo for the North Pacific. There's been one for the South Pacific, for North Atlantic, South Atlantic, the Caribbean, um, and this Arctic one um, that's currently underway. 
And these are kind of the seven societal goals, societal benefit areas that are forming the structure of all of the working groups. Um, and so there are seven of them. And we actually had, um, I think, US co-chairs of uh, five out of the seven or six out of the seven. So we had strong US participation in all of these working groups. Um, next slide. So the process for the Arctic um, Action Plan is supported by the Danish Center for Marine Research. Um, and they're doing this in collaboration with the IOC, the Intergover Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. But they um, established early on a task force um, for this planning effort. Uh, so that included myself and Craig Lee. Um, Lee Cooper has also been participating for IASC. Um, the Arctic Observing Summit Indigenous Working Group nominated both Austin Amasak and Adelaide Amasak um, to the task force to increase diverse, diversity and in indigenous representation. Um, the meeting times I think have been really challenging since most of the meeting times have been at um, 5 a.m. Alaska time, which is challenging for all of us. Um, and the overall process has changed as a result of the coronavirus. It originally um, was planned to have an in-person workshop last spring in Copenhagen, um, similar to all the other regional meetings, three to four days in length and very detailed um, planning discussions. That was canceled and instead there was a, um, a webinar process that was established with working groups for each of the societal benefit goals. And that this was done um, looking at a 10 month process to develop an action plan. So we also, the Arctic is a little different than the other regions in, the, in that the regions, the other regional meetings helped develop the overall implementation plan, whereas the Arctic is actually focused on an action plan. And again, you know, kind of that thinking transformational, the goal is to move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want. And so, you know, it's always think big, think transformation, where, do, where are we now and where do we really wanna be in 10 years um, from now and how do we get there? Next slide. So to date, um, all of the working groups have met uh, multiple times, at least three times. Um, and there was the, um, the special session that Henry talked about, which was on December 2nd. Um, the task force met again on December 10th. Um, the working group chairs have met since that time. Uh, the working group six of which I'm co-chair and is the data management and data infrastructure uh, working group um, has had two additional meetings since that time. And all of that input has gone into the first draft of a plan that was developed by the Danish Marine Institute staff. And in fact, while Anne was speaking, I got an email with a copy of that first draft. So the task force have, has received that draft. We have a meeting on the morning of the 28th of this week, and we'll be looking and discussing at that draft. There'll be some revisions and then it goes out to all the working group chairs. Next slide. And I'll describe that a little bit more. So I think um, in looking at this, the participation in the working groups was uh, 418. Um, it was a closed group. They cut it off after a certain amount of time, uh, thinking that there were, um, they wanted to keep it fairly small. So. The, by keeping it like that and first come first served, it wasn't, the working groups um, weren't necessarily, uh, didn't always have the right people in them. Um, we did have the ability to add some new members to the working groups as we went along. But I think one of the challenges was, um, was a limitation of, certainly of indigenous knowledge holders. These were not represented in all working groups and nor ad adequately in all working groups. Um, there was limited participation from Asia, uh, limited participation from uh, our Russian colleagues. Um, so that became, um, it, was a, it was a challenge to put together action plans when you didn't necessarily have all of the players um, in the room. But I think the good, the good news about it is that it was a process, it was started, people were very motivated, they were very supportive. Um, technically, I think the, um, 
the webinars and the process that was used um, all went ahead pretty much without glitches. Um, there was there's a lot of support in doing something and using the ocean decade as an avenue for making progress on a number of high priority areas in the Arctic. So I think there were there were good things that were accomplished so far through this process, um, but definitely challenges. Um, and a lot of the challenges we've talked about in the past about um, poor internet um, in a lot of our remote communities makes it really difficult for them to access um, and participate. The time zones um, is always a challenge um, when you cross so many um, time zones over such a large span, um, et cetera. Next slide. So I think that the Danish ministry wants us to emphasize that this process, the working group process, the working group input is just the start. It's the starting point for a lot of additional um, review comments and additional input from, from a, a wide spectrum, including indigenous organizations, industry representatives, which also were not represented very well, um, and nations that weren't represented or, or weren't able to participate. Um, there's also, um, they're emphasizing that this is actually version one of an action plan that's being developed in 2021. Um, and the Danish um, responsibilities for that will end in May. And at that time, they are hoping that some other nation will take or organization will take up uh, the lead of this and keep updating and um, considering this a, a living document and keep updating it over time. Um, as things develop. So they hope that somebody else will take on action plan version two in 2022, 2023, whatever that time might be. So we should consider this as a, as a, as a living document, as a process rather than a plan that then um, you kind of adhere to for the next 10 years. Next slide. So next steps um, today, the task force received the preliminary draft of the action plan. Um, we'll be reviewing that meeting on Thursday. Um, there will be a revised draft that gets sent to all the working group chairs for their initial comments on February 5th. Um, and then on February 25th, the draft action plan will be made available uh, for community review and it will be on the website oceandecade.dk. Um, March 16th, there will be um, an online public presentation um, and presentations by all of the, by the task force, the uh, Danish ministry and all the working group chairs. And then that review process would close out March 25th, which allows about a month for incorporation of all of the comment received and a final draft. Um, we had talked with the task force had talked about lengthening the process, but it was pretty clear that the Danish ministry um, uh, that their commitment um, and I think their financial commitment for support ends the first of June. There was also a desire to get a deliverable to um, to the Arctic ministers prior to the Arctic ministerial meeting in May. Um, prior to the Arctic Science Ministerial meeting to these other meetings, and that uh, there would be a handoff at that time. So there seems to be a pretty firm uh, deadline, at least for version one of this um, report. Next slide. And I just want to emphasize that these are some of the preliminary cross-cutting themes that came out uh, from all of the working groups. Um, and one of them is uh, lack of environmental data, monitoring, knowledge, tools, hinders progress towards ecosystem-based management. Um, and that uh, lack of understanding of the value of the Arctic um, ecosystem and involvement of local indigenous communities hinders um, evidence-based, sustainable, and equitable governance. So the actual governance of the Arctic is really hindered by that lack of understanding of the value of both the ecosystems and the involvement and um, uh, the value of local and indigenous knowledge. 
Um, safe lives and livelihoods are challenging to achieve in the Arctic due to um, a lack of knowledge about the risks and, um, and having the tools to address it. And then we talked about this a lot about how the access to data infrastructure and data is often limited and unequal across um, various parts of the Arctic. Um, and as we've talked about a lot that the involvement of local and indigenous people and in knowledge is essential to the su success of any kind of a, a program we might have. And I think that might be the end. Yes, that is the end. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions as well. Or Craig, if you have anything you would like to contribute as well. Uh, that, that seemed like a great summary, Molly. Haven't had a chance to read over the things I just sent, but. Yeah, yeah. It's been a little frustrating for both Craig and myself because we've advocated early on for a different process and basically we're shut down and we've advocated for a few different things and, you know, I haven't gotten very far. Um, I think uh, one of the uh, pieces that um, Henry and Melinda brought up about the question of process that the UN is not following its own process in terms of indigenous involvement and knowledge. I think that has been taken to heart finally. It wasn't, it wasn't early on, but I think finally now it has. And um, there's uh, a lot more, I think, engagement at that level and discussion about how to, um, how to better uh, engage and involve um, indigenous organizations, communities, uh, knowledge holders, et cetera. So that I think finally got attention, but I think it wasn't until about December that that really happened. Well, thanks to you both, um, both for presenting today and for the, the work and advocacy you've been doing on the organizing committee or the task force to make this process as, as, as useful as it can possibly be. Um, we have now, uh, if everyone saved uh, the, the appropriate amount of time on their calendars, we, ha we still have 15 minutes for discussion. Um, and in the absence of explicit discussion questions, um, I think where Henry, what, what Henry teed up and that's still sitting in the chat, uh, I think is a valuable place for us to start. Um, IARPIC, uh, can continue to convene meetings. Uh, Melinda um, through IARC convene, convened uh, with the support Henry mentioned was also able to convene a very useful discussion. And it looks like timing wise, um, trying to have some kind of discussion between the, uh, the February draft release and, and its uh, expected return date would probably be helpful, but I'm, I'm jumping straight to pragmatics um, and I wanna open the floor to deeper thoughts uh, um, on, on what you've heard and, and from other working group chairs, Brendan's on the line as well, who's been uh, co-chairing a group. Um, uh, how, how can we make best use of this opportunity? Brendan, please. Thanks, Sandy. <clears throat> Thanks for convening this um, conversation. So I, I, I have a question um, maybe best addressed by uh, Molly and or Craig, but anybody um, feel free to. I, I'm just sort of wondering if, are we in a situation where um, in North America, we are um, making progress, albeit um, frustrating at times in doing a better job of inclusivity, particularly with indigenous people in these science and policy processes. Um, but I think my, my impression is that um, many of our colleagues in um, Europe see this fundamentally differently. They look at this issue of uh, inclusion in a different way. And do you feel like through this process that, that you guys have gone through with the UN decade, are, are, 
are they beginning to see, are, are the people on the task force, are they beginning to understand um, what we're trying to accomplish in North America at all? Is, are, have, have I identified a, a, a real difference and are, did we make any um, headway um, through this particular episode? Uh, good question, Brendan. <laughs> um, as I said, I didn't. I don't think the um, as much as Craig and I tried. I don't think the topic and the issue really came to the forefront until December, um, and so it's it's just recently. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because in Europe, the the primary indigenous community are the Samis in Norway, um, and then. Um, Greenlanders, but this whole process was managed by the Danish Marine Institute and Denmark has a, you know, a relationship with Greenland and often it's not a very, you know, so I don't know what exactly, I think there are a lot of issues with that relationship and also um, it really kind of left it to Alaska and the US to really bring up the issue. Um, Canada was not has not been as involved in this process um, for whatever reason. Um, uh, some Canadian um, partners were on the working groups, but I would say not a lot of them. And I'm not quite sure why that was um, as well. But I, this is definitely a global UN issue. And so um, it is a high priority for the UN globally. So it's making just that educational awareness that the issue is important in the Arctic as well as other regions of the globe. So I don't know if that answers your question, but we'll see what happens in the we'll see what happens in the draft. <laughs> yeah, that, I think there has been a a late awareness mm -hmm. of the problem. To to what degree? They recognize it in the same way that we recognize it. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I did have a chat with um, some of our colleagues in Denmark a little while ago, and it, it was pretty clear that they were seeing, originally they were seeing a lot of this through the lens of their interaction with, with Greenland, with the Greenlanders. So for, for things like the, you know, the baseline issues of connectivity, um, Right, they they were assuming a much greater level of of connectedness in terms of internet and telecommunications than than exists in other areas, simply because that exists in Greenland. Um, you know, the time zone, I'm not sure what to say about that. Right, that was an ongoing problem through the, the scheduling things at times that were just insanely inconvenient for for some parts of the world consistently, but. But I, I, I think it's just a really different lens that they're seeing this through. And it may just take lots of pressure over a long period of time to, to educate people and bring them around. Yeah, thanks. I, I guess that's what I'm struggling with. I'm, I'm headed to Norway for the next few months and I'm sort of struggling with, well, how can I um, help with that education um, and, and recognizing that, you know, I don't, I don't have all the answers. I don't think we're in any particular position to, you know, lecture other people on, um, but, but so I like the, you, you mentioned both pressuring and educating, and I guess I feel like the most appropriate role for us is to try to educate um, in a humble way. I'm not sure we're having any standing to pressure people. Um, no, I, yeah. Sorry, I mean, I mean, pressure in a really aggressive sense, but just the, the you know, the the bringing it to, to people's attention. Yeah. Right. Consistently. You want me to speak up? And... Uh, this is Melinda. You know, I'm I'm listening to this, and you know, in 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 our indigenous community, we have people that have. Definitely um, 
have the long haul as well as the stature in, in, in some of these realms. And of course, uh, Daily Sambo is one of them, right? She's got a huge history with um, the UN from an Alaskan perspective. And, and I'm just thinking about, you know, what she could contribute to the rest of um, the rest of the indigenous community that's coming on board in this process, right? Um, as well as being, um, and maybe she's been involved, I don't know. Maybe ICC has been involved. Um, I'm not sure where they're at in, in this process. Um, but I think that, um, you know, our, we have natural networks in the indigenous community that often um, uh, when we're dealing with having to be reactionary because we haven't been there in the beginning and we're trying to figure out how do we, you know, come on board, get oriented, um, make some kind of, um, you know, significant contribution in terms of even being at the table when we're trying to get oriented. Um, but thinking about uh, uh, this process, um, you know, if we, if we know that we have a poor internet connectivity, then that should be addressed, right? Um, uh, as much as people may not be um, inclined to hold audio conferences, it's still a, it's still a reality. You know, um, and and thinking about uh, that, and thinking about you know what are the the mechanisms that um, can get indigenous peoples um, a little bit more on board, uh, both in, in in terms of who's involved and who or who may need to know about this, right? Um, and I'm not sure, like you know, if, if, if this is even being shared out at the, the Marine Science Symposium this week, if it's, if it's being discussed and most of, you know, that's probably my fault not knowing the agenda. But in terms of, um, it, to me, the, the whole issue of time zones and the issues of poor internet connectivity, um, those, are, those are manageable um, things that can be addressed. Um, what struck me about the, um, the comment period was to see the, um, the date that it was going to be let out. And then it's not until March 16th that there's going to be an online presentation. And it seems to me that that could be bumped up could, because between March 16th and March 25th, that's a really short timeline. You know, the one thing with indigenous people, if we're trying to make sense of something, um, <laughs> we need a little bit of reflection time, right? I mean, people who are, who are well versed in it and, um, and have had time to think about these plans and think about these processes can then weigh in, but we're trying to we're trying to come on board on all of it. And you know, I just had this. Uh, excuse me, it's my phone. I just had um, the same experience with some of our long-range management plans that were, you know, not accessible, you know, to to our indigenous areas that were passed through under this this administration, and it's. Um, you know, it's hugely uh, an issue that, you know, you, you can, we can come up with a different process. And uh, so I'll leave it at that. No, I agree totally with you, Melinda. And we did advocate for a much longer review period and uh, extending the date, but um, the Danes were adamant. And, uh, <laughs> And I think there is there will be some benefit, hopefully, in having something also that will be ready for the Arctic ministerial meeting. So hopefully, it is it is something that um, enough people, at least in, at some level, can um, advocate for, um, and um, hopefully some priorities that can make reach a high enough level that maybe they do increase resources at various um, levels for doing some of these priority action items. But yeah, I appreciate it. I also that. wanted to just quickly intervene. The I think the review period is from February 25th to May 25th for the document, but the public meeting is on the 16th, was what it looked like. No, it's February 25th to March 25th. Is the, the public review. meeting on the 16th. Mm -hmm. And they've also offered to do, the, I know they're sending letters out to, um, to ICC and to, um, uh, Ali Prebolov, um International and other participants of um, indigenous participants of the Arctic Council and offering to do special sessions as well and um, other information processes. 
So I'm aware that we're at the end of our discussion time and there, there's probably, uh, I think, an opportunity for, for this group, especially those who've been very connected with the decade to continue to put our heads together to make sure that there's um, ample awareness about the process and ample opportunities for people to um, submit their comments. And so it, it sounds like we maybe have a, a month or so to think about what that, uh, what a, what a good process might look like, or, or uh, you know, people can obviously do anything they want independently. Um, but if there's a way that IARPIC can support this, um, or Molly, I know Ayus, uh, you threw your hand in the air to support ongoing discussions. Melinda, you know, looked for ways that IARC could continue to support the discussion. But I think this group of people um, has a uh, has a has a shared view of what would be valuable in terms of increasing the the opportunities for feedback and the diversity of feedback that we're hearing, and so let's uh, let's build on that. Sandy, I did want to chime in. I actually um, both the agenda and the meeting invitation have us scheduled for ninety minutes, so I think this is a great time to close. And oh, okay. Um, if anyone, I'm sorry, wants to I thought it was seventy-five. Yeah, no, I think we changed it a few times. So I'm, I'm happy to keep the Zoom open for a few minutes um, if people want to stay on to discuss. Um, okay, great. Well, and seeing Melinda say, having the public meeting will be offered sooner along with the special session soon um, would be helpful. So maybe what we could do there, I don't think we're going to get the March 16th because they're seeing that as Arctic wide public meeting but um perhaps um uh getting the um the indigenous organizations to host or support and i'd be happy to help with this i know others would um something earlier in that process that's more of an informational here's here's what's in it here's you know think about this and um get some initial feedback might be helpful having that sooner, like in early, earlier in March. Do you have any ideas about that? Yeah, I definitely think um, earlier, uh, you know, March is, March's time is when things uh, ramp up, right? People are getting out on the land and they are less and less um, ready to be um, in front of a computer or on a phone. And so I think, you know, raising that, that's come I ask if it, anything was being shared at the Marine Science Symposium this week um, for just awareness, right, um, about, about the process. Um, um, I don't, not really. Um, you know, the Marine Science Symposium is so different this year because it's, um, you know, all the uh, science talks and poster sessions are all pre-recorded. Um, there's a number of panels, but not one on this. We're limited in the number of panels, um, keynotes. So this really is not a major part at all. We could, I, I haven't looked at the agenda for Alaska Forum on the Environment about getting mm -hmm. um, some kind of a presentation there. Um, we could look into that as one option too. But again, that's all for, you know, that's going to be all virtual too, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that um, AFN just stood up their climate task force. Um, I'm not sure who is on it yet. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. waiting to hear that, but you know, there might be some, uh, and as well as um, <clears throat> NCAI, um, they have a, uh, they have a climate task force that would probably be interested in well, and I think that there's two aspects of this, Melinda. One is just um, more of a education engagement about the, this process is underway. But mm -hmm. I think there's also a second aspect because I, I do think as Liz um, brought up, uh, the US is not part of UNESCO right now, but I think the US is coming back into the UN fold and the UN and its organizations will play a larger role in US international policy. And is there a way, is there, what are their priorities? How do we elevate some of the things that people have wanted to do in this realm of ocean research for the Arctic? 
that would have been limited by resources and what can we do to use this as a vehicle for elevating, um, trying to achieve some of these things in the next 10 years? Maybe it's better internet for everybody. I don't know, but you know, that definitely could be one thing, a goal for the next 10 years, but, um, but what, what else? So I don't think we should just focus totally on process and understanding, but also um, uh, what do we want to achieve? Mm -hmm. But people have to know about it, right? Mm -hmm. People have to be aware that it's coming down the pipe. But I think there's already been a lot of discussion from people about things they want to do through the Arctic Observing Summit and through other mechanisms. Um, so in, in some ways, there, there's been discussion, but now this is a new vehicle that may be potential for actually trying to achieve them. Even though there's no dedicated pot of money, it, it has the potential, I think, to generate some dedicated pots of money. So another thing that I think would be worth um, thinking about in terms of maybe just even smaller group uh, engagement, or it also could equally be IARPIC wide, um, from, from this working group meeting when the when the Danish um, Marine Center started outlining what they saw as the cross-cutting themes. Um, observing was high on the list and data was high on the list. And, um, and one of the things that I think some of us felt frustrated by was that there wasn't going to be further discussion on the cross-cutting teams mm -hmm. or on the cross-cutting themes across the working groups. Um, that uh, that seemed like it was probably warranted. Uh, and, and so with the draft that you and Craig and the task force have just received, it might be valuable to think about, um, you know, how can we either reconvene some of the people who were involved in the workshop and have um, some of these cross-cutting themes in, in the crosshairs and say, you know, and maybe maybe the maybe the drafters got it right and looked across the four groups and kind of found a good synthesis. Um, but but there might be room for further discussion uh, on those, and, and that certainly seems appropriate for for this team to be um, trying to accomplish uh, when we have something to react against, of course, which we don't yet. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, Sandy. I agree. I, you know, we need to digest what they've said. Um, they haven't been terribly receptive to suggestions for changes, though, <laughs> over the course of this process. Um, okay. Well, i I think that uh, I think that we've probably uh, met at least our our initial goal of um, coming together and having a discussion around these, identifying the opportunities, reminding ourselves of what the timing is. And, um, and so I, I, I suspect that the group of people who've been trying to pull together some of these uh, discussions um, can pull out our calendars and, and find some opportunities and make sure that they're well published through all of our various networks. Um, uh, moving forward, but uh, but today I just want to thank everybody for joining and for contributing to the discussion. I think it was uh, it was valuable. I, I learned some things that I wasn't aware of, especially vis-a-vis -vis the national committee. So I think staying connected to what's hap happening at the national and global level is really vital throughout this whole process. Um, so, and any other closing thoughts, Will? Uh, co-chairing this meeting and Sally, I think we had to lose after the first hour. No, I'm good. I think it was good. Um, I was able to come on and back off. I, 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 think, I think there's a lot more to do here, obviously. Um, and so this is a good group to get started, but I hope we can sort of continue some of these threads. I had a, a few more questions I wanted to ask, but I, I think I'll save them for, uh, for another time. But I think this was a good start. So I thank everybody for their time.
Great. And so the observing team I can speak for um, will be meeting again at our, our regular time, um, the third Wednesday of the month. Uh, and best wishes to you, Molly, and everyone participating in the Alaska Marine Science Symposium. Um, the link was dropped in the chat and we will see you all again, hopefully quite soon. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Andy. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.